Yeah, so the, um, the panel is called Imagination in Action, and uh, we have, uh, like uh, Anna said, we have four. So the first paper is going to be War of Narratives, Christianity, Iconoplasm, and Decoloniality of Race and Religion by Shalini Kankar from UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, then we have Dalit Futurism, Degenerate Desires to Deface Dalit Iconography by Atika Singh, Stanford University. Uh, then Sufi Futures in Sri Lanka, Saints, Shrines and Ruptures of Space and Time by Shobana, M. Shobana Xavier of Queen's University. And then Looking for Cure, uh, Queer uh, Cohabitations by Pratik Paul. Pratik is not coming. Okay, so we have yeah. three then. No, Maha. Oh, sorry, Maha. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. He's <laughs> going to ask only nothing. Nothing but I mean, it's wrong. Okay. So Recontesting Rights Regime, South Asian Women and the International Human Rights Agenda by Mahali from Leiden University. So without any further ado, let me hand over the proceedings to Shalini. All yours. Thank you. And I will flash these five minutes, two minutes, okay. and one minute cards. Thank you to the members of the Center for South Asian Studies for giving me an opportunity to present here. And thank you all of you for coming here. Uh, in this presentation, I examine Christian icons in Punjab. Uh, and the relationship to the larger discourse on race, iconoclasm, and decentering whiteness in the United States. I analyze the appropriation of Punjabi idioms woven into Christian icons to interrogate the alleged case of forced conversion of lower class, uh, lower caste, excuse me, Muslim Sikhs, and the atmospheres of violence. Focusing on the beheading of Christ in Mary's Pieta statue in a church in Taran in 2022, I investigate the iconic materiality and vexed histories of the religious symbol to posit this question. How do Christian images signal liminal material presences that oscillate between their identity of sacred icons and hegemonic monuments of white supremacy? I propose that the Tarantaran Pieta is a polysemic image, a neo-colonial figure of oppression and trauma packaged as a religious icon, a sacred image promising deliverance, and a visual metaphor that lays bare volatile race and caste conflicts. The talk is divided into three parts. In the first, I trace a brief history of Dalit, Mazhabi Sikhs, and the specter of caste in Punjab in context of its changing dynamics within the backdrop of Christianity. In the second part, I examine a conceptual trajectory of Tarantaran's Pieta and its symbolism by analyzing Christian icons in the West and their framing within imperial aspirations and the binaries. In the third, I turn to Walter Mignolo's praxis of decoloniality as a way to steer away from these binaries following his idea of a pluriverse. So let me begin part one with a short video and uh, this is a snippet from 2023 documentary by Surabhi Singh. It's called The Broken and uh, it's a the whole title is broken, Dalit Sikhs fight back in Punjab. <laughs> escape, escape, okay. Should I click or? Um, escape again. Okay, there you go.
ਪੂਰੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਸਤ ਮਿੰਟ ਕਰਕੇ ਵੀ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਨਾਮ ਦੀ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਕੋਈ ਜ਼ਮੀਨ ਜਾਂ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਕੋਈ ਘਰ ਦੇ ਨਾਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰ ਸਕੇ a masabi sikh becomes the emblematic figure of caste oppression in the state of punjab in northern india dalit sikhs such as chamar leather workers and masabi sanitation workers derisively titled chuda are the outcast groups in the sikh community scholars have documented caste conflicts between jats and dalits and recent media reports have exposed what ran ranki ram calls as exploding the myth of casteless sikh society Punjab is a Sikh dominated state with 63% of the population being Sikh. In comparison to the rest of India, it has the highest number of Dalit population at about 32%, making Punjab's villages predominantly both Sikh and Dalit, but they share an agricultural land is only 2.4%, with the majority of the land being owned by the Jat Sikhs. The rising caste discrimination within the Sikh society has disillusioned Dalit Sikhs. who at one point of time had embraced sikhism in the hope of uh, escaping the social ex- exclusion imposed on them by the hindu varna system unlike the hindu social order caste system in sikh society works on different parameters principles of caste hierarchy persist in punjab more in terms of land ownership social status martial strength and dominance in mainstream sikh religion and state politics rather than on brahmanical ideology In fact the highest caste in Hindu varna system the brahmans are marginalized in punjab and wield no power in mainstream politics and religion that is dominated by jat sikhs since sikhism functions on the doctrine of equality many lower caste hindus were attracted to it sikh castes both the mazhabis and the jats are lower caste hindus that fall in the shudra and the ati shudra category so both of them belong to the lower caste after embracing sikhism uh, they continue to follow their previous practices such as segregation untouchability and caste antagonism the jat sikhs as agriculturists became the dominant caste in the state during the sikh empire of ranjit singh subsequently during the british rule uh, there was a land alienation act that was passed in 1901 which further uh, ostracized the mazhabi sikhs as it allowed the jat sikhs to uh, acquire and you know keep their agricultural land denied land ownership political social status by the upper caste and in the absence of alternate job avenues and better education and here i would also like to tell you that the mazhabi sikhs have separate gurdwaras they have separate eating places they have separate marriage halls and even the cremation centers are divided segregated along caste lines so now they are turning to uh, you know the because the master slave relationship is maintained because they work for the uh, jat sikh landlords and they don't have any way of escape from that so here within this comes christianity post 1950 the indian government criminalized caste discrimination and abolished untouchability but despite its reforms caste based oppression continues trapped within caste stereotypes dalit sikhs in punjab have been trying to find refuge and solace in alternate religious spaces such as deras dargahs and christian churches although christianity first came to punjab in 1834 in maharaja ranjit singh's time it is only in the last 10 15 years that christian churches uh, have grown in punjab and there are six major denominations including roman catholic and pentecostal that is spread across the state 
Christianity opens its doors to people of all castes, economic backgrounds and religions, but as the quote of Father John Graywall uh, encapsulates, the primary objective of missionaries is proselytization. In the past two decades, many Dalits in Punjab have converted to Christianity in large numbers, uh, and Jat Sikh dominated organizations such as the Akal Takht and its chief Gyani Harpal uh, Harpreet Singh has accused Christian priests and pastors of illegal and forced conversions. Uh, now is the time for another video. Um, let's see. Skip. Drag it to the side. Yeah. Well, just the screen behind me. Yeah. Okay. So, that's the yeah. so this is a, a Pentecostal pastor by the name of Ankur Narula, and uh, he claims to be building the largest church in Asia. And he's <laughs> that missionaries are spreading Christianity through fraudulent means, luring vulnerable Punjabis into their fold by offering cash or engaging in dubious healing practices. While calling for an anti-conversion law, Gyani Harpreet Singh affirmed that to counter such practices, Sikhs should open modern weapon training centers. Dismissing his remarks, uh, Bishop of the Diocese of uh, Amritsar, he said no conversion is taking place and every religion has a right to express itself in India. So I'm going to just speed up now. Uh, the, this verbal sparring has led to a tug of war between Jat Sikhs and Christian missionaries as the former also see their hegemonic grip loosening over the lower caste in Punjab and instead being replaced by rising dominance of Christian priests and pastors. Even after conversion, Dalit Sikhs retain their lower caste uh, to avail preservation benefits from the government. For them, Christian icons of Jesus, Mary, the cross, the church become spaces that promise deliverance. As Dalit Christians, while attending church services, they are allowed to keep their visual markers and emblems of Sikh identity. This blurs the distinction between Christian th Sikhs and other Sikhs. And so there is this new category that emerges in this conflicted terrain, the figure of the crypto-Christian Sikh that straddles between two identities, a Dalit Sikh on paper and visual form, but Christian in religion and practice, a liminal figure caught between the antagonism of church Sikhs and Christian missionaries, adding yet another layer of complexity to this unfolding war of narratives. Amidst growing religious polarization between Akal Takht and Christian missionaries, an undercurrent of unease hangs in the air. And in 2022, uh, August 31, four masked men entered the infant Jesus Catholic Church and held the guard at gunpoint, beheading the Pieta statues of Jesus and Mary with an act shouting, We are Khalistanis. The assailants also accused Christians of creating a mess in Punjab. Before departing, they set the car of the Catholic priest uh, on fire and they actually you know, took the decapitated heads of Mary and Jesus with them. This incident sparked protests from the Christian community for attack on Christian icons. So let's delve into the concept of iconoclasm, which comes uh, in the, from the West. So within Christian context, the meaning of icon and idol are convoluted and remain a contentious issue that began in the Byzantine era 
Christian missionaries documented their encounters with idol worship in New Spain and India, demonizing their deities and worship practices. So here you have this painting by Rubens, uh, and it shows uh, Xavier right here. He's pointing to the heavens, and uh, a beam of light flashes and breaks the uh, Hindu idol into two, um, presumably a Hindu idol. So here, a superior and legitimate icon is replaced by uh, sorry, uh, an inferior and illegitimate idol is replaced by a superior and legitimate idol that of Savior, justifying the act of iconoclasm and the will of God. The globalizing mission of proselytization in Christianity reached magnanimous proportions when combined with colonization. And here we find uh, Uniper Serra, who is uh, this uh, uh, missionary in, uh, who came to California in the 19th century and he is called a civilizing pioneer on one side and on the other his critics call his actions as genocide of native people perpetuated by the catholic church uh, in 2020 on juneteenth uh, activists condemned and removed sarah's statue as you can see right here with the black lives movement and anti-racial iconoclasm attacks on icons of mary and jesus also increased in which their statues were defaced and decapitated in florida boston new york among others so christian icons erected in united states and around the world are invested with power inscribed by the catholic church onto the sacred images and likewise by their critics that use iconoclasm to send similar messages to the Catholic Church, challenging their globalizing mission by attacking icons that they revere and hold sacred. Just quickly going to show you this image of Black Cross. To add to this conundrum of iconoclastic controversy, in 2020, the Pontifical Academy for Life, and this is from the Vatican, they released this image, which portrays a black Jesus in the arms of a white Mother Mary, uh, which is described as blasphemous and very disturbing and a woke led um, uh, you know mission uh, by some Chris, uh, conservative Christians so here um, I'm going to um, just quickly uh, share this quote with you from Janice Fiamengo who's an author and a conservatist she says presenting Mary as a white woman holding her son black son, Pierre could well be seen as perpetuating white supremacists, showing that white came before black, that black is not possible without white, and that white remains the great mother of us all. Instead of decentering whiteness, the Pierre actually recenters it. Whiteness thus is a tangible part of iconography of Christian icons that okay, just I'll just finish up. So here you can see I'm back to the uh, you know icons in Punjab. And uh, the idea that if, if, since these icons are white, uh, I'll just share one more quote. If Jesus is white and God is white, then authority is white. So this idea sort of continues in Punjab. And now to go to my conclusion here. Uh, the Tarantara Pieta in this context actually functions as a neocolonial signifier, representing that white remains the great mother of us all. Yeah, just conclude. Yes. However, through the iconoclasm of Taratara, the post-colonial subject is further entrenched in the divisive binaries of the West, where the center-periphery paradigm is replicated between Masbisic, Jatsik on one side, or Jatsik or crypto christian Sikh on the other, further deepening the chasm in a society divided by religion and caste. To decenter these binaries, uh, Let's go to what Walter Mignolo um, suggests. Uh, he suggests the idea of a pluriverse. And it's a space where different identities and religiosities and genders can coexist. And he says that that should be rooted in some indigenous epistemes, away from the boxed Western idea of the self as a center, where the other remains fixed in peripheries defined by the West. So in context of Punjab, one way of envisioning this pluriverse is, and we've been talking about Vedapura a lot, is, is through Begapura, a notion propounded by Dalit Sikh Guru Ravi Das. Begapura is a land without sorrows, a casteless, classless, non patriarchal, democratic world. So, in this paper, I tried to map out a conceptual 
trajectory of Christian icons in Punjab by examining the iconoclasm of the Ferrothran Priyata to examine how it functions as a polyvalent site inhabiting multiple uh, narratives intersecting with race, color, caste, bound through oppressive binaries and as a way forward, away from this circular logic of dominance and subservience uh, can be envisioned by uh, you know going back to Guru Ravidas's idea of Begampura. And and just, sorry, okay. ask you to stop and, because and in the interest of time for okay. the other. Yeah. So I'm just going to yeah. stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have time to ask you know, questions in the QA period. So, all right. So, all right. next week there is Atika. Yeah. Please. Are you using slides? Yeah. Okay, great. So let Matika introduce her paper. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Matika. The mic is off. I'm a first year PhD student at Stanford in the Department of Art and Art History. Uh, thank you, Shalini, for the fascinating uh, presentation. I see a lot of resonances between our work. Um, today I'm going to talk about Ambedkar as an embodied surface uh, and the degenerate desires to deface Dalit iconography. This is an abridged version of my continuing fieldwork, and for this I thank my, prof my supervisor, Professor Ushaya, and my JNU professor, Shukla Sagat, for their mentorship. The caste system is an enduring codified system of oppression. South Asia with the lowest rank constituting Dalits. This is more for Stanford where they really lack sense of dignity with a descending sense of contempt, which also affects the diaspora. Um, I'll just move on from this, yeah. However, Dalit communities, as majorly artisanal castes, have always nourished sturdy countercultures of poetry, sculpture, language, and many other art forms rooted in a firm ethos of dignity. In this vein, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the architect of India's constitution and a leading theorist and organizer of Dalit identity, uh, remains an icon due to his anti-caste assertion continuing into the contemporary movement. My emerging doctoral research topic examines the vehement destruction of Dalit iconography, including statues of Ambedkar, Buddha, and other anti-caste icons, and of, um, of caste oppressed constituencies like Ravi Das, Jyotiba Phule, and Kabir. The persistent defacement of subsequent and subsequent protective caging of anti-caste statues has been an everyday occurrence, especially in multiple remote sites, since the 1950s. It is as if that the surface of Ambedkar itself acts as an embodiment of a deep investment in a diabolic inheritance of caste. Most often than not, it is only the face, eyes, raised hand, or the constitution of India that is vandalized by miscreants, who are majorly from the upper castes. The targeted attacks reveal a direct attack on dignity. For instance, the raised arm is a signifier with multiple potent meanings of calling forth, showing the path forward, of directing focus and attention, of pointing to liberatory, emancipatory futures. Hence, it's a gesture towards Dalit futurity. And it is this futurity that the defiler seeks to attack. However, extremely rare archival material on the violence exists. The only material available in the public domain are often journalistic reports covering quantitatively the ever-increasing incidents of desecration. There has been extremely limited engagement with the spatial politics of the caste aesthetics context. At a broader level, public sculptures as signifying device has had a long history in India. A colonial era practice, it has now been domesticated by right-wing powers that proclaim their self-importance and dominate the skyline through gigantic incarnations of mostly men in bronze. The canon in the park idea of public art to describe nationalistic endoviers to condense the granular history of a region into individual figures or narrative statements of historical events 
now dominates our sidelines everywhere we that we go. On 14 October 2023, a statue of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was unveiled in Washington, D.C. This is the largest statue of Ambedkar installed in the U.S. And, and it is the actualization of a dream of Ambedkarites the world over. The statue is supposedly a replica of the world's largest statue of equality, which is a 125-foot sculpture of Dr. Ambedkar that was also recently erected in Telangana in southern India. Both the statues as well as many other iconic Ambedkar statues have been sculpted by the renowned artist Ram V. Sutar, who is also the sculptor behind the Ambedkar Memorial Park in Lucknow, the flagship albeit controversial architectural project of Mayawati, India's first Dalit Human Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. However, in Uttar Pradesh, as well as in many other parts of the Indian subcontinent, as well as South Asia, commemorating the memory of Dr. Ambedkar is still a distant dream. The desecration is a custodial phenomena built on the exclusion of Dalits from first, labor, welfare, second, land distribution, and thirdly, legal rights, often with rounds of severe bodily punishment and a perpetual wait for justice. Recently, for instance, the right arm of an Ambedkar statue was broken by an unknown assailant in Nimka village, just a few miles from Delhi. A spate of similar incidents followed for days around the village. As I speak, a few days back, a teenager named Sumesh was shot dead by police firing, which had ensured after a conflict regarding the installation of an Ambedkar statue in Rampur in Uttar Pradesh. The incident, unfortunately, was a severe reminder of the 1997 riots in Mumbai in Ramabai Nagar, where more than a dozen were killed simply because they were protesting against the desecration of an Ambedkar statue. The riot went on for months. These rising incidents of atrocities committed against the cultural expressions of the Dalit community are witnessed, alongside a rise in statue making and practices of memorialization and historic commemoration in the contemporary era. Hence, it becomes necessary to ask why do the statues of revolutionary anti caste figures, especially Dr. Ambedkar, ignite both extreme passion and hatred? What does the surface here exactly tell us? The politics of public sculpture propelling ideological concerns and emotional ecologies of touch has been growing. Therefore, the phenomenon deserves a broader inquiry into not just the act of defacement, but also the uneven legal and aesthetic discourse around it. The issue of identitarian iconoclasm in spatial politics, especially in the context of a contemporary decolonial context of a mounting global challenge to monuments, also necessitate the states of this, of this inquiry as timely. These innumerous dotted rural sculptures made by the community by their love echo historical resonances that have contemporary ramifications on a and culture as they act as a telltale case of iconophobia and iconoclasm being instrumentalized for a sinister project of erasure of the material culture of the Dalit community, often through lethal and violent acts of deliberate destruction stemming from degenerate desires steeped in caste-based notions of taste and aesthetics. As an instance to elucidate the narrative, recently a desecration took place in Haryana near Palwal at a close distance of 50 kilometers from Delhi, the head of an Ambedkar statue right after Ambedkar Jayanti was slashed off at midnight. The desecrated statue was depicted wearing a red embroidered tie and blue suit as an embodiment of dignity, carrying the red colored book of the constitution of India in the left hand because the village has been a left bastion. The right hand held a scroll, possibly an educational degree or a newspaper. The height of the statue in particular was a point of contention amongst the Dalits. The less than five feet high statue evoked legitimately hurt feelings of humiliation as the figure of a maker appeared diminutive in front of humans, albeit mostly men. After the maker statue was found to be vandalized, a police report was filed under section 295A of the Indian Penal Code for outraging the religious feelings of any class. However, no resident was aware about the charges or the content of it. As for the locals, the statue was only installed a few days prior to mark the occasion of the Jayanti. The event is an apt reflection of the upper caste monopolization of spatial, social space and appropriation of representation. Most of the national media also reported the incident to have taken place in Jatoli village which is 90 kilometers from Delhi and a neat distance of 40 kilometers divides both the villages with a separate set of issues. No person in either of the villages knew about how the confusion was spread and reported. At a close distance, another Ambedkar statue stands with the upraised right hand cut off, despite being placed on a brick pedestal of six feet. 
Another diminutive one in a nearby village has been desecrated 32 times in a single day, leading to being guarded 24 into 7. Often, desecrated statues are arrested by the police and kept in custody as evidence of a charged encounter. The state of affairs is a stark reminder of severe caste fault lines in a right-wing India. As the figure and thoughts of Ambedkar are steadily becoming internationally known, the Indian government is simultaneously ensuring his words don't reach the masses. In this light, it is pertinent to note that the University of Delhi recently removed an elective course on Ambedkar from the undergraduate program in the philosophy. The move has been met with widespread opposition and criticism. Meanwhile, the assault, however, continues. And the thinking uh, complicating for us questions of legality, embodiment, and iconography. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Could be short and nice. Next speaker is M. Shobna Xavier, and I better introduce her paper. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I think the themes of defacement will probably continue into this presentation as well, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, so my uh, work currently is on Sufi shrines in Sri Lanka, um, and I've been essentially, since 2013, been documenting um, Sufi shrines. Um, with kind of field trips over the last 10 years. And some of this has also been supplemented with um, archival research, particularly um, British Library and various other places, including in Sri Lanka. Um, and so I'm at kind of the early stages of trying to think about this project and frame this project. So I really appreciate the context to be here and to share some of this work with you. Um, in terms of broader interventions, I think in, for folks who think about this stuff, uh, there is kind of this move to think about Islam in Sri Lanka either as Tamil Islam or Sri Lankan Islam. Um, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of these things now, but I'm happy to answer some of these questions. But I do understand Sri Lanka as kind of engaging with Islam as it's being exchanged over the Indian Ocean. So particularly from, let's say, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, South India particularly as well. Um, and I also see or notice broader kind of reformist and renewal tendencies unfolding in the Sri Lankan context. It's quite similar to what's happening, let's say, in India, or Singapore, or Malaysia as well, particularly in terms of growing anti-Sufism, um, Salafi Islam, if you want to frame it that way. Um, but the Sri Lankan context, I think, is also unique in some important ways that need to be marked and that the Tamil Islam framework sometimes flattens. And that's, you know, aside from the post-colonial context, it's particularly the post-Civil War context, which just recently ended in 2009, um, or has ended in a military capacity but is ongoing in other ways, which I could kind of talk about. Um, and the Singhala Buddhist majoritarianism, which we heard from a paper yesterday, is also informing a lot of what's happening to the minority communities, namely Tamils and Muslims as well, where the two minority communities existing in kind of this totalitarian regime. And so this has also meant that there's a growing Buddhist extremism that's informing how Islam is responding or engaging or trying to survive. Ultimately, I am a scholar of Sufism, so my interests are in that, and I'm a religious studies scholar, so that's going to frame some of the questions I'm asking. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is, so I'm an ethnographer, so this is really weird for me to start thinking about archives, but this kind of helps you understand the predicament intellectually that I'm in. So as an ethnographer, what I have been doing is mapping shrines, but I didn't realize that I was also archiving shrines. Um, partly because of the Buddhist majoritarian state and the ongoing violence in Sri Lanka, a lot of the shrines in the last 10 years that I've been documenting have also become non-existent. So this is the defacement component of it. Um, so as a result of this, I started thinking about what the archive can be and what is the archive, particularly from an ethnographic perspective. And this has landed me in the works and important works of black scholars like Catherine McKidrick, uh, Christina Sharp, and particularly Satya Hartman, who's been thinking about the archive in a capacious way. Um, the archive also made me nervous because I didn't want to get stuck in this memorialization project, but it ine inevitably is. And so this archive thing led me to the future thing. And so this is the archive future nexus that I'm kind of negotiating and 
working within. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to share with you today at the very early stages. Um, and the memory aspect is also marked by just the post-war reality in Sri Lanka. Uh, we're having continual discussions about uh, unmarked graves that are being found in copious amounts in the northern peninsula, um, missing persons, very similar to some of the conversations that came up in Bluchistan yesterday in terms of women um, who've been protesting in Jaffna about missing their, their children, their sons, right? Um, so there's like a really serious sense of memory and memorialization, particularly with the graves, right, and dead bodies. So these should also start kind of resonances with what Sufi shrines inherently are. Um, and so, and then there's also real land grab politics, um, particularly in terms of the government for electoral redistribution is taking land from farmers, from Tamil folks, and also particularly for a nationalist project to take some of the land and build uh, Buddhist uh, stupas. Um, so one of the shrines that I've been working in since 2013 has been a place called Dr. Jelani, which is the top of the mountain, um, mountainous reserve in central Sri Lanka. And on this side, you'll see it just kind of, you walk up the mountain and there's kind of an entrance, um, and the entrance leads into a few mosques that are in the caves, ultimately. Um, and so this is a picture of the same spot in 2013 when I went, which is quite devastating for me. Um, so they've essentially, and this is the, the military has essentially used COVID and the lockdowns to build um, uh, hotels, um, ATMs, bathrooms that you have to pay for to use. Um, this huge lion, the Singham, as you walk up marble steps, um, drumming constantly going on. So even to get to the mosque, and in August when I was there, I had to go through a military checkpoint and tell the army that we were going to the mosque, and the mosque is kind of still in the little corner and they were trying to do the prayers, but all you heard was the um, drumming in the background. So it's like sonically very overwhelming, but um, it's quite intense. So even in the span of my own field work, you can see kind of the shifting topography of the space. And this is why I'm struggling with this archive feature and nexus in terms of the possibilities that Sufi shrines in have, but also the fact that I'm visibly seeing them being like erased in my own time, which is a bit daunting as an ethnographer. Um, and again, there's broader things going on to the Muslim community in Sri Lanka that also makes this case particularly um, unique and um, difficult, especially in terms of the Easter bombings and kind of this framing of Muslim minority communities in relationship to radical Islam, and a lot of this is coming from a state perspective as well. So recently, actually when I was in Sri Lanka this summer doing field work, um, there was a documentary that came out that framed that the Easter bombings were uh, kind of um, led by the government and so even though initially when the bombings did take place in 2019 i believe it was framed as something that um, small muslim communities which had radicalized had enacted um, and more and more kind of um, kind of things are coming out but no one is really being held to accountability ultimately so in this kind of messy situation i've been thinking about sufi shrines and and saints as particularly so acknowledging kind of the transnational context the indian ocean linkages and and by the indian ocean linkages you'll see shrines to saints that are buried in South India, for instance, that have a replica model in the eastern coast of Sri Lanka that's also quite similar to Singapore and Malaysia. You'll find shrines to Persian saints, Yemenis, Arabs, Patanis, like, so there's quite a bit of diversity as well. Um, and what I'm really interested in is this idea of cosmological nodes. Um, and in Sufism, there's really this rich uh, possibility of engaging with cosmos and metaphysics that really intersect, kind of stop our conceptions of time in a linear way. Um, and so this is where my engagement with the futures is really coming in from. Part of the reason that Sri Lanka is really interesting, or Ceylon or Serendip has been interesting historically to Arabs and Persians and many others, is because of this popular narrative that when Adam, the first um, patriarch in Islamic Muslim, um, Jewish and Christian traditions was expelled from paradise, he landed in Sri Lanka, and he landed with one foot on top of a mountain called Serendip, I'm sorry, which historically was seen as Serendip or India, but over time gets narrowed down to this one mountain, um, and that mountain has retained the name Adam's Peak, and so there's a common pilgrimage practices that takes place there. And, and Monica and I were talking about some of the maps at the library here, and even the maps that date back to the 1850s here also have Adams Peak as kind of the main point on these maps, which I'm excited to see after the presentation today. Um, and so this 
this kind of point or this node becomes the reason why other people constantly come to Sri Lanka, right? It's kind of what they see on the horizon. And then you have a lot of other fun stories. Um, Katharagama is another place that's kind of south central, and it's associated with Hither, who's this perennial mystic that's unnamed in the Quran. Uh, but Hither has apparently a relationship with Alexander, this kinder, and this is very common across Malaysia, Singapore. There's a lot of shrines to um, Alexander. Taran Saba is doing some interesting work in Singapore around this. Um, Katharagama is interesting because it's a site associated with Hither who just happens to visit every seven years. He's not there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just there every seven years. So you can see how time is really fun when you start going down these paths of Sufi narratives. And so even though these are the main sites, and Dr. Jelani was an image that I showed earlier, which is associated with the 12th century Baghdadi saint called Dr. Qadir Jelani, um, kind of a Sunni Baghdadi scholar. And so he also apparently came to Dr. Jelani, meditated for 12 years, put his hand on a cave, and I've gone down into this cave. It's, if you're a claustrophobic person, it's not fun. But apparently he put his hand out and then vanished to Mecca. So there's also time traveling. <laughs> so these shrines are really fun, and it's, this is the basis in which I'm engaging with kind of time and space and a little uh, bit, so playing with it ultimately. And there's some components of gender as well that I'll talk about. Um, because Adam repeatedly fell to Sri Lanka, um, there's kind of a rich story in Islamic um, traditions, particularly Hadith traditions, that uh, the people of Adam's time period, the early prophets, were giants. Um, and because human beings became morally regressive, we got shorter along the way. Um, and so the earliest descendants, including the prophet Muhammad, um, there were big people. And as such, you have these rich traditions across um, Mecca, Saudi Arabia, but also in Pakistan and other places where you have tombs to giants, ultimately. Um, in, in Tamil, Oli's just means saint, so it's just kind of the Tamil version of um, Auliya in Arabic. And so throughout Sri Lanka, one of the fascinating things you'll see is a lot of these giant tombs, and they're often so the name as being 40 feet long. Um, and so this one in Thalamanar, which is quite close to South um, India, um, some people believe belongs to Adam and Eve, and there's different narratives about who these figures could be. Um, some people believe that it's not real, but it's in fact the story of it is what matters, and people will go and light incense and have particular rituals. And there's lots of different shrines associated uh, to long, um, long figures of giants throughout Sri Lanka. And I think this is particularly fascinating for me is because it does put Sri Lanka as an island in a different time frame entirely, right? It's operating in this context where time is like time of the past, but also potentially kind of moving forward as well. Um, the other thing that I've noted with some of the ma maps, uh, mapping project that I've been doing is namely of women saints. So because of anti-Sufi um, tendencies and Salafi influences of Islam in Sri Lanka, along with a lot of other places in South Asia, what it has meant that women's stories and women's narratives and women's physical placements have been marginalized or often pushed out of mosque spaces. Um, and what I've been finding is that there's been a lot of shrines to Sufi women across time. Um, this one particularly of the Natya saint is really interesting. So there is a, uh, there's a rock where there's a memorial there and you can see since it was raining, I wasn't allowed to go onto kind of the rock because they were worried. Uh, but right across the rock on land, there's a really small mosque that's associated with her. Um, and it's a space that only women today, even on Thursday nights, they would go together and pray at. And men are not allowed in that space, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and the Natya saint particularly was kind of a story that emerged because she was so beautiful and was bathing in the water and these assaulters came and when I talked to some of my interlocutors I asked who were the assaulters and they would say they were white men and so the white men here is a bit tricky because it's the white men of the British, the Portuguese, or the Dutch, right? And they often don't kind of verify the, the aunties around the shrine will just kind of tell you well they were the white men. When you, why are you asking more questions? Um, and so I was like, okay. So some of this in terms of historicizing is a bit tricky, right? Because I can't actually historicize and there's no archives and kind of this nation state project. And so I kind of have to just take these stories for granted. Um, Hussein Bibi is really also quite interesting. Her shrine exists in a parking lot outside this madrasa. And if I was telling you yesterday, um, she's a Patani woman who lives on Slave Island, which is one area where historically um, kind of endangered labors were kind of restricted to keep. And you could kind of go to the space and ask the guard for a key and he'll watch you. Because if you go on the right side, I'm not allowed because I'm a woman, it's going towards the madrasa. But if you turn left to go to the shrine, 
to see the same BBs and that's okay. So it's interesting how these kind of negotiations continue. Um, and as a woman traveling across Sri Lanka looking for Sufi shrines, I'm often at the mercy of men. And so I have to kind of stand behind men waiting for them to open these doors. And so thinking about Sufi women um, from a methodological perspective is also quite fascinating in terms of access. I mean, I'm sure it would have been a different experience for others who would have done this project. Um, so this is some of the data that I'm engaging, and this is kind of some of the ways that I'm asking this question about Sufi futurism. Um, and it is a question, I don't know that I fully arrived at kind of a place where I could be a, kind of confident in some of my um, uh, outcomes, but I am also not pulling this out of thin air. There is a lot of interesting work on Islam um, and Islamic futurism and Muslim futurism. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about some of this work is that inherently from a Quranic perspective, there's a lot of resources and a discourse around otherworldly possibilities in the Quran. The idea that inherently that there are multiple worlds, that there are jinns, there are other kind of species. So the Quran, according to some scholars, particularly from a philosophical and theological perspective, is not always imagined as human-centric. It just means that those kind of ontologies and hermeneutics have survived. So I started thinking about some of this, um, and also in terms of some of what Sadaf was talking about yesterday and uh, some of the art collectives that are emerging in the US. Um, there's been conversations and conferences on Muslim futurism. This is how it landed to Sufi futurism. Um, and Saks Afridi, who Sadaf was talking about yesterday, where there's a lot of other artists who are playing with this idea of Sufi futurism. One of the issues for me is that this is coming from a Global North perspective, and I'm really conscientious of thinking about it in the context of Sri Lanka specifically and all of its particularities. Um, but my Sufi futurism that is shrine-based and saint-based is not necessarily sci-fi or technological or aesthetic. So this is where I'm veering a little bit differently from what I'm seeing in terms of movements and collectives. Um, I am learning a lot from scholars, black scholars, queer theory, um, and indigenous scholars who are playing with futurity. Um, in the context of Sufism in Sri Lanka, I don't know if it's viable. This is kind of the part that's a little bit depressing. Um, and so I'll kind of conclude on this. Um, there is this huge possibility for fabulation and speculation and mythic because it's there. I don't have to make it up actually, right? It allows time bending and space bending. You know, there's these wonderful stories of Sufi saints in the middle of the war um, in Kantankuri who apparently interlocutors would tell me would uh, raise his hand from their grave and catch bullets to protect its neighbors, which are humans. So when those stories exist, it's like real and present and in the moment, right? Um, so I think for me, and this goes back to some of the conversations we had yesterday, is that the future that is being aspired to is it's a survivability. It's in a moment of now, and it's not relying on a future. And I think also that this future doesn't have to rely on the actual shrines. It actually relies on the stories and the memories. And I think that's sufficient for now, especially in kind of the hegemonic state of Sri Lanka for Muslims. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Shobhan. We were exactly on time. So, uh, uh, so for the final paper of the session, I'm going to invite Maha Ali. That's uh, recontesting rights regime, South Asian women, and the international human rights agenda. So. Oh. oh. Okay. That's, uh, Uh, which essentially, according to this scholarship, began in the 1970s. 
as the politics of decolonization and communism diffused and the international community eventually started to pick up the subject of rights. I try to argue that the existing scholarship on human rights has not only largely overlooked the women's history, but more particularly the history of women in Asia. Um, as, as existing scholars of human rights have presented a largely American and Eurocentric history of the subject, which does not do, the, uh, do justice to the holistic study of it. I began in the 1940s, which were not just a challenging period for the feminists in India while aiming to establish themselves as a powerful rights group in the larger anti-colonial project, but also specifically in the struggle with the Indian labor unions and more specifically women in their labor movements. Mani Bhankara was one such powerful name in the Indian labor movement, not only for her activism in the field, but also for her leadership in the Indian trade union Congress of the All Indian Railway Men's Federation and also being a founder, founding member of the International Confederation of the Free Trade Unions. Being a consistent advocate for the rights of workers' unions, women, and minority rights in, in India, she had pushed for equality within political participation for all minority groups within independent India. And in 1946, before independent India, she said that elections for newly independent India could not be considered free and fair unless participation from all minority groups was fully encouraged, including the participation of all Indian scheduled castes federation. In January of 46, members of all Indian scheduled castes federation were attacked and fatally assaulted, allegedly to prevent them from participating in the elections. Kara then wrote in Times of India warning about election disturbances being caused by such attacks from opponents, and that any majority of groups who stood for civil liberties and equality were jeopardizing in the democratic process through, the, through their violent acts. But her anti-caste and anti-class activism was not merely a product of the 1940s, rather she had been actively involved in pointing out hypocrisies of the colonial British government and the upper class Indian elites in power since the 1930s when she was indicted under charges, charges of sedition by Chief Pre Presidency Magistrate of Bombay for promoting class hatred um, with the use of the term capitalist. She was later acquitted by the Bombay High Court uh, as Justice Nanavati noted that the term capitalist was too vague to denote a definite and well-defined class to be considered under the ambit of Section 153A of the Indian Penal which penalized inciting class hatred. This, however, would not be the first or the last of her encounters with the Indian judicial system in challenging the class and caste hierarchies in India. In independent India, she had also frequently challenged the government's policies and aimed to democratize knowledge around much of the under-discussed political issues in Indian politics through her weekly paper called The Radical Humanist, of which she was a managing editor. This also frequently brought her to Bombay courts yet again. As in 1950, she was indicted under the Indian Official Secrets Act of 1923, an anti-espionage act introduced by the British colonial government, which was not only applicable to Indians under the British government, but also Indians outside of India. Kara was indicted under this act for having published a government letter which laid out policies for the future of workers in India. Alongside Kara, M. N. Roy was also charged for contravening provisions of the act. Um, he was, as he was also a leader of the Radical Democratic Party, of which she was a part. Um, so the strong linkages were proved in that case. Eventually, with the pressure, pressure of labor unions, Oscar Brown, Chief Presidency Magistrate of Bombay, acquitted them in the case after the, after the hearings, and this marked yet another one of her triumphs against the persisting colonial legal system in post-colonial India. The stories of state-sponsored crackdowns against workers, communists, feminists across the border from India were no, were no different. The Democratic Women's Association of Pakistan, which was formed by elite leftist women in Lahore, had aligned itself with the Communist Party of Pakistan. Since the state had viewed Communist Party with great suspicions and it eventually banned it, the Democratic Women's Association was also meted out the same treatment by default, causing a hiatus in the radical women's movement for about a decade. 
However, as opposed to India, Pakistan did not create much space for women within its government ranks as such and neither as representatives of the state. Hence, the role of women within the public sphere was suppressed not just within leftist and civil society movements, but also within the policy making arena. In the late 40s and 50s, there were only two women who were part of the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan, Shaistai Kramula and Jahanara Shanavas. Both upper class women with Begum attached to their names. Shaistai Kramula recounts having started her parliamentary career with dissent. And during her maiden speech to the assembly, she pointed out that there was growing disillusionment and a feeling of being neglected amongst the people of East Pakistan, where the increasing, increasingly growing opinion was that they were being treated as a colony of West Pakistan. However, then Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan had, had disregarded and trivialized her concern regarding the matter by stating, women never really understand the practical difficulties of such matters and the considerations which actually need to be taken into account for undertaking major practical decisions. As part of her role in the Constituent Assembly in 1948 and 56, she was then asked to represent Pakistan at the UN General Assembly. In 48, as part of the third committee of the UN General Assembly, she was involved in the drafting process of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where she, where she was advocating for freedom, equality, and the right to choice being enshrined in the Declaration and is famously known to have championed the inclusion of Article 16 of the Declaration, that is, equality in marriage, also bringing under its ambit the prohibition of forced marriages and child marriages. Lakshmi Menon of India then, who was also in the third committee at the time, had fiercely argued for the addition of non-discrimination on the basis of sex and the equal rights of men between men and women. This was alongside Hansa Mehta of India, who on the United Nations Commission of Human Rights and also on the drafting committee of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was ad ad advocating for the substitution of the phrase, all men are born free and equal, which was introduced by René Hasson of France with the phrase, all human beings are born free and equal under Article 1. Evidently changing the name of the document from Universal Declarations on the Rights of Man to the Universal Declarations of Human Rights as we see it now 76 years later. This, however, cannot be appreciated without considering that both Hansa Mehta and Lakshmi Menon were upper caste Indian women. At the same time, they were making monumental advancements in the international human rights agenda. While this was happening, the erasure of Dalit women's agencies within the domestic sphere was also happening, coupling with the silencing of voices internationally by upper caste leaders. The All India Scheduled Castes Federation, under the leadership of Ambedkar, with the support of Dakshiani Vela Yudan, the first Dalit woman in the Constituent Assembly of India, had filed a petition to the United Nations in 1940s alleging that the position of untouchables in India was far worse than any claims made by the Indian state at the UN General Assembly to highlight the situation of Indian minorities in South Africa. This petition came soon after Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, India's first representative to the UN, had moved India's first UN resolution at UN General Assembly against South African apartheid policies and the resulting persecution faced by Indians living in the regime. But Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit was not the only Indian woman at the UN who was pushing for minority rights for Indians outside of India. Hansa Mehta, within the UN <coughs> Human Rights Commission, was also pushing for the formation of sub-commission on minorities and discrimination at the UN to protect the rights of mar marginalized communities. During her speeches at the commission, she made specific <coughs> references to the rights of Indians living under in, in British colonies other than India who had been transported as indentured laborers by the British and were entitled to their rights as minority within the communities residing in foreign lands. She explained this further by emphasizing the importance of their economic rights and the discrimination faced by such minorities based on their race or ethnicity. With this agenda, however, she was discouraged by the British delegate within the same session to pursue the subject of economic and political rights of minorities any further. The British hesitation regarding granting political and economic rights was connected to their fears 
of having to endorse such rights for all colonial ter territories as well. Limiting the human rights agenda to civil rights, like freedom of speech, religion, and assembly was a safer colonial bet. However, Hansa Mehta's speeches at the Human Rights Commissions had already made waves internationally and had made news all the way back to India. This evidently triggered Dakshiani Vela Yudhan and Ambedkar's petition on behalf of All, Indian, All India Scheduled Caste Federation to the UN regarding the rights of minorities within India. They alleged that Dalits being a minority within India were also being discriminated against against within India and hence deserving of the same protections which were being claimed for for Indians in South Africa due, during, uh, due to their minority status. The Indian elites at the UN were conveniently forgetful about the plight of oppressed classes within their own borders and criticizing those in other countries which they, might, which they were guilty of as well. He argued for the question of scheduled castes in India to be admitted to the UN Committee on Minorities in order for them to be able to achieve minority status under the UN as well. The Indian state, however, responded to such arguments with the dismissal of any claims that Dalits or any other such scheduled class, classes should be regarded as minorities in India at all, as they were all an integral part of the Hindu community, and Hindus are the largest majority in India. This selective amplification of upper caste Hindu voices at the UN was also serving the larger nationalist narrative both domestically and multilaterally. Jan Smuts of South Africa then used this opportunity brought in by Vilayuddin and Ambedkar's plea at the UN during his rebuttals against India's attacks on apartheid policies in South Africa. However, Indian state tried to repress this international plea, terming the Dalit issue as domestic and a social and religious problem rather than the apartheid in South Africa, which was more a serious legal and political problem. So the women of South Asia at various stages introduced their own brands of feminisms and human rights domestically and internationally, which differentiated their ideas and demands from those of feminists in the West. Many of these newer Asian brands of human rights and local feminist activisms, which had origin originated as early as the suffrage movements in Europe and the US, had also evolved into domestic movements in the post-colonial context that had challenged the very premise of what had been defined as being an Asian feminist domestically through nationalist movements as well as demand equality with men fighting for minorities while also situating themselves as a minority group and pushing for their own social economic rights. In the later decades, the events held during the UN Decade for Women allowed all these women's rights activists, state representatives, civil society actors to come together at one multilateral pl platform and discuss issues pertinent to all women regarding, regardless of their race, nationality, ethnicity, political affiliations, etc. Many times, it was South Asian women who were seen at the fro forefront of staring these discussions. Uh, however, it was not in the 1970s that it was the first time that such conversations were taking place at the UN. As the South Asian women as early as 1940s were holding important positions on the Committee of on the Status for Women, on the Drafting Committee of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and being elected to the UN Gen uh, General Assembly uh, Presidency, which has been actually funded, as well as the Vice Presidency of UNESCO, Rajkumar Yamal Kaur. Hence, without understanding their contributions in these international roles, as well as through their transnational sol solidarity networks, the scholarship on human rights remains limited. Asian women and their influences in human rights discourse domestically and internationally have been notable, albeit not well recorded. And exploring these trajectories can lead to more holistic understanding of rights making through a wider lens, with a more layered, gendered analysis within the post-colonial states. Thank for Q and A. So I would invite the, the speakers to maybe to come here. Uh, yeah, we have enough seats. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Thank you. 
I would like you to also just introduce yourself and a bit. Hi, I'm Manju. I have been to this week. I was one of the people who was interested in this project. And I was very engaged for. I have a question for Shalini. Um, and this is related to um, the figure that you talked about, uh, the desecration of the Pieta uh, in that specific village. Um, I was thinking about, because you clearly use this as like a way to talk about the different discourses in that particular space. Um, and I was thinking if you could also think about um, that act in terms of, say, um, desecration, uh, somewhat similar to how Adhika had conceived of the desecration of the Ambedkar statues, um, because, and then use the terms of say dignity, because when this was being presented, it also came to me that perhaps could we not see this as say like majoritarian violence against um, the religious assertion uh, and the identity of low caste people who have used this particular idiom for that purpose. Uh, so for one thing that I really would like to know more about is like what are the kind of spiritual affordances and the transformations that um, that it see uh, Christians themselves bring to this space. Um, how can we conceive that? Because I know that you post Bigampura at the end as a kind of way to get out of this equation, but a lot of scholars, for instance, in the case of Kerala, something like Sanal Mohan, he's written, he's written really, really interesting things about how Christianity itself becomes a very important idiom of like the spiritual richness that, and outside of this kind of colonial framework. So for me, I keep wondering, is it really useful, for instance, to think about this in terms of decoloniality, considering how much that discourse has also been taken up by um, uh, the right wing in India in various ways, uh, in, in a way to differentiate between homegrown spirituality uh, and what they clearly see as impositions, whatever, which is basically the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, including, uh, unfortunately, Mignolo himself endorsed a book um, uh, or like a work which was saying the same things. So I was wondering if decoloniality is actually the suitable way um, to address something, as you mentioned, deeply complex like this. Yeah, thank you for that question. So uh, in my presentation, I talk about multiple narratives. So one of those narratives is decoloniality and we cannot like leave it because uh, this uh, particular village is about less than two hours from Jali Amanabag. And uh, while I visited that memorial and you know, it's now a tourist place, but there's a very interesting thing which also binds this idea of missionaries to the Jali Amanabag tragedy. Uh, one of the reasons uh, other than the role act and other uh, uh, reasons for the massacre were given was there was this missionary she was um, you know crossing this lane in Amritsar she used to live there and because the people were so upset with the Britishers they actually attacked her fortunately she was saved and uh, General Dyer you know he got very upset with that incident and that was one of the one of the triggers for the massacre and after the massacre what he did was he made it uh, that lane into a crawling lane where the natives had to go on all fours as they would do to their own uh, you know temples and uh, mosques or other places of uh, religious worship because he said this is an icon there although you know it was just a space she was not there any longer and uh, there's a scholar um, Lal, who relates this to christian icons so somewhere in the collective memory these things are unresolved uh, you know, the trauma from partition, it sort of goes from one generation to another. It has not been uh, addressed. And that is also, you know, goes back to British uh, colonialism. So here I tried to present multiple narratives and I didn't, uh, you know, uh, get a chance to talk about my meeting with uh, uh, the the Thakar Pura, Pura village, uh, his, uh, the bishop there. Uh, Father John and you know I, I spent hours with him and he s seemed to be helping people around and that's why the first part of the presentation was about how these uh, Christian icons are uh, you know 
figures of salvation because nobody is looking in the larger society nobody is paying attention to mazhabi sikhs i stay about 20 minutes away from uh, the border of punjab you know i mean from chandigarh and all my life i've been in the us for 20 years but while growing up i had no idea that there was caste system in uh, the sikh religion and i went and talked to a lot of mazhabi sikhs who converted there in the village of takarpura so their stories are not being erased because that the idea of crypto christian comes from there but we need to see it in totality we cannot just focus on the crypto christians on the dalit issue or on the caste issue that is one aspect the other aspect is figures of salvation and between these two is the whole uh, idea of colonization and the post colonial subject and this collective subconscious which is still traumatized so that's how i see it and i thought you know begampura is a perfect way to uh, envision you know we talked about utopias uh, last um, uh, you know yesterday a lot so uh, it is an utopian idea but i i feel you know then christianity you talk about dignity so christianity is also one of the religions there but people are not converting because they are economically deprived or socially ostracized they are doing it out of because they want to you know they like christianity or they like hinduism or they like sikhism or islam and you know that kind of a, a order which is more like horizontal and not like vertical exactly yeah i had a Introduce this is just for the record. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> um, hi everyone, my name is Aksa. I also presented yesterday. Um, I have a question for Shobhana. Thank you so much. I really loved all the presentations, um, including yours. I wanted to know if, like, during your ethnographic research, you came across any um, evidence or research in speaking to participants about how the future, like the Sufi futurism in Sri Lanka in particular, is being shaped by or might be impacted by um, ecological change and climate change because my some of the work that I do on the side is on Muslim environmental ethics and how Islamic cosmologies are being changed and in a way are shaping Muslim um, environmental ethics and embedded practices of how Muslim communities, particularly in countries like Pakistan, but also Indonesia, are coping with climate change from an Islamic perspective, right? So I want to see how or if in any way that played into your research. Thank you for the question. It's funny because when you were doing your presentation yesterday, I was thinking about that and so wondering. Um, so within the Sufi communities that I have thus far engaged with, it hasn't come up. Um, I would recommend Alex McKinley has a new book called, um, oh, it's on Adam's Peak, but one of the final chapters in the book, he does talk about futurism's relationship to species. And um, Adam's Peak is this place where pilgrims have historically come. And one of the things he looks at, which I think is fabulous, is that he looks at how monarchs have also been pilgrims to this to site, right? And so even though there's all these hydraulics and water systems that are being built up on top of this mountain, um, partly because um, of the pilgrims that are coming, right? Um, he says, you know, despite all of this ethno-nationalist stuff that's happening, and you know, Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Buddhists fighting against each other, even though it is now officially a Buddhist site, um, at the end of the day, like no one really wonders why monarchs historically have migrated to Adam's Peak to end their life there, right? And so I think that is like maybe more in line with what you're looking at. Um, in terms of my own stuff, I think Katharagama has like possibility because it's tied to the water of life. Hither was often associated with this place with, you know, um, finding the water of life, and that's why Iskander Alexander was following him, or Moses was following him, these various uh, stories you hear about Hither. And so there is a water fountain there, but what's interesting is that that water fountain, which the community took so, like, as I understood it, to build, is not really sustained. Right, it's like locked up now, um, and there isn't water flowing out of it. So I don't. I am now thinking more about uh, the environment, um, partly because of you know, like your presentation yesterday, and then broader context of Sri Lanka. But as an immediate thought, it hasn't been something that um, my own interlocutors have been expressing to me. So it would probably be an imposition on my end or production on my end to take some of it. But maybe it's there, and I haven't looked seriously. But thank you so much for the question. Uh, yeah, the amazing presentations. Honestly, I mean, I just picking up on what Anju said, but also Shobhana, your 
hesitation where you said, well, you know, this is sex, a freely, but you know, it sort of doesn't work for me. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting how that desire to build theory from the facts rather than put a theory on top of things and with the hierarchies. Um, you know, how many papers you listen to where there are people, you know, mostly in the global north, but not really. I hear this in Indian universities as well, where there's still, after all these years, forget just the Indian penal code being colonial, but still after all these years, scholars obliged in this whole citation game of drawing the theory from overseas and imposing it in the world. And I really thought what you said about you don't need it because in a way the, the facts give you the theory. It's there. And I, what I found really enriching about all the papers was just that, that you're building the theory from the facts, not coming in with this heavy-handed approach, you know. Like, you know, my, your analysis. I mean, there's like a million new books coming out. Manu Chandar has a book on Hansa Mehta, I think, and, you know, and so on. But again, like Manu has this whole thing where he's just putting something, I think, on top of her, you know about liberalism and, you know, the discourses that are there between Princeton and NYU. And not like these women in the 1950s. Uh, we are just doing a biography, uh, autobiography of, uh, of Velodhyan. Uh, her autobiography will publish maybe next year. Um, you know, I don't need to impose a theory on her because she had her own theory. Are you in touch with Ram Dastia, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. But, but, you know, she has her own theory. You know, Hansa Mehta has a theory, they are very intelligent people. And there seems to be this urgency. I don't know what it is about scholarly careerism, but I just wanted to say, you know, salutes to you guys because you really don't need it. The facts have their own theory and these are thoughtful people that you're studying. You know, like Ambedkar. Baba Sahib doesn't need, you know, somebody to show up and say John Rawls. You know, fucking Baba Sahib is more than John Rawls. And in two days it says Jayati, you know. And do we really need John Ross to understand or other people, you know, John Mills and so on, or Walter Magnolo? I don't think we need them, honestly. And I'm not saying this from a nativist point of view. I'm saying this from a point of view human intelligence. Like Hansa Mehta doesn't need an interpreter. Yeah, she produces her own theory. Yeah, Mangalika Jisilva, um, uh, my question is to Shobhana. So um, I wonder whether uh, you talked about Islamic uh, Muslim futurism, so to sort of, I want to kind of trouble this idea of futurity, yes. about idea of futurity oh, okay. or futurism as somehow promising a, a narrative of redemption and emancipation and liberation, let's say, for um, as originating from a minoritarian side, right? So in your field work, I wonder whether you are able to kind of, you know, given the history of, uh, you know, the, the history of Sikhana Buddhist nationalism and the Buddhist, uh, you know, at various points in history, Buddhist campaigns against uh, minoritarian religious edifices like churches, mosques, uh, Hindu temples, uh, Sufi shrines, etc., etc. Um, whether you could sort of uh, extract a conception of Buddhist, and, and I hear being very violent, but majoritarian futurism, uh, uh, which is really predicated on defacing, destroying, profaning, uh, 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 and heterogeneous sort of Sri Lankan past that sort of, uh, that includes, of course, colonialism, but also Muslim, Tam uh, you know, Muslim and Tamil and Christian. What about the majoritarian futurism project? Which is already there. It's not something to come. It's unfolding. Um, uh, and, and can I also pose another question? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, to, uh, to, to Atika. Yes. 
So you use the term defacement, right? And in the in the word itself is the is the notion of the face, right? And um, something very tangible, concrete, but also abstract. So my question is, what is given all the images that you actually shared, right? Ambedkar um, being defaced, desecrated, caged, right? So in a sense, in a in a cell, in a prison, right? Structure, uh, the imprisonment of um, Ambedkar, um, right? Um, uh, uh, metaphysical imprisonment of um, Ambedkar. What is it about the face of Ambedkar um, that sort of attracts hatred, violence? And, and, you know, I'm sort of trying to kind of get you to uh, uh, talk about that, about the face in, in, in defacement itself. And my question to Shalini, sorry, uh, is that um, a citizen also promises a narrative of equality, but why, what's precipitating and accelerating sort of, you know, this conversion to to, you know, this religious conversion, right? Uh, what is it about the Christian narrative of salvation that's very, that's seducing, appealing, and attractive actually to uh, to those who are sort of, you know, living in conditions of inequality? So maybe we'll go in the order of Shobhana, Atika, Um, I don't look at just uh, future, it's not something I'm thinking about, um, and I think you answered your own question in the sense that this. It's presupposed. Yeah. It's presupposed in your analysis, though. No, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so I think, like, I'd start by the word desecration and why I don't use other. Uh, sorry, defacement and why don't I use other words so commonly like uh, desecration. One thing is that desecration also connotes a religious angle to mm -hmm. it, yes. but then that sidelines a secular angle yeah. that all the Fambedka statue also embody mm -hmm. because they don't necessarily come to the community and the land that they are put on and installed and unveiled because there's like a religious celebration of a festival or there's like a religious gathering. They come because of the contestations of land uh, primarily. So one thing is that with the word, and I've thought of other words honestly, and I'm still thinking through these terms because they are heavyweight terms in itself and they denote so much more than, than just like an aesthetic inquiry. They denote an anthropological inquiry or sociological inquiry, so much more. Um, other words that did come to my mind were like vandalism and all of those things, destruction, um, and anything that's like plain and doesn't like encapsulate a secular vehement idea of land does not sort of do justice to the project is how I've like felt about it. Yeah. And also the dichotomy here is that whenever I'm on the field, these words come to me in Hindi. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are my own, uh, you know, the way I read them in English. Mm -hmm. And Hindi honestly has like way more words for when you just install but not unveil when you unveil and celebrate, but when you just unveil and not celebrate, uh, and those get erased in the canon of the fatherly English. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's one thing. And then the other thing is also that it's not just often the face. There are three parts that are attacked. One is the face and the eyes, then yes. there is the finger, and then there is the constitution of India. And these have become potent iconographic signifiers of Dalit assertion and they act as pride markers. Like if today I were to drive by a very rural deep interior of say a village in Uttar Pradesh which does not exist on the Google map, uh, I just know it's a Dalit settlement because I see the statue and I know it's like my people and I will get refuge there. Uh, so these have become like, they signify that we won this land, we won the narrative and then this is the space where you actually come to us and this is where we reign over the politics and the cultural sensibility. So the taste is ours, which is why something that I'm still figuring out in my, this is like the first year, um, is also that these statues do not have a very polished iconographic form. Mm -hmm. They look with, it's like they are embodied with a very soft touch of love. 
and you can see the love of the artisanal and not the artist here um, which are very different from say Kajri Jain's work on Mayavati's statue in yeah. the yeah. In Noida, yes. which has been the dominant canon to understand how Dalits come to the space of art history um, that's one thing and I felt that honestly it's these three things that are attacked because this is a space purely dominated by men they're built by men, they're commemorated by men, they're attacked by men Women have had a very, very low stake participation here, except in those villages where Kanshiram cycled. Mm -hmm. And there is a charged electricity and a resonance that's still happening. Mm -hmm. There women have really come to the forefront and stopped bulldozers by hands and by bodies to say you will not bulldoze the statue. But in most other villages it's honestly like men and it's like how uh, intermediate and upper caste think of the face and the hand as something that reflects their own complicity, their own position and it's like somebody like it's a deep hatred when you see an aesthetic, a cultural signification of the other who you do not see as human enough you only see them as animal like unfortunately, it's also that reflection mm. but the gap here is that uh, Dalits have told me and I also feel that growing up when we would make statues and how they were rampantly desecrated by the others in the neighborhood that this is so much the caging and you know how the cage has become maybe this is the only the, the only case in the world of the cage becoming a part of the iconographic mold itself yes. uh, you know where um, I felt maybe this was like a very like an apt reflection of the incarcerated lives that Dalits live. Mm -hmm. So you, how you feel is how you built the statue. Yes. Basically it's a direct take on creation. But apart from that, the lacuna that my project has right now is that I have only spoken to the communities. I have never got a chance to speak to the assaulters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have not been able to access jails. Like Shobna was saying, it's a project on the mercy of men basically like especially because they're so rural there's like a lack of whenever I've accessed them it's big with my friends from JNU and it's always like uh, without having the resources basic resources of say electricity transportation I felt very unsafe also mm -hmm. of being stuck in these places of not having access of network in my phone and simple things like that um, which is um, which, which has really stopped me accessing police sites where the statue has been kept and the assaulters have been kept even if for one day it's not in it's not incarceration it's just like a detainment uh, but I've not spoken to them so far uh, what has led them to feel so strongly about just the face of it uh, yeah. so um, yes Sikhism um, is based on equality but as I said in my presentation that um, because of being lower caste as Hindus, they converted um, the Mazhabi Sikhs, uh, I mean they converted and when they entered Sikhism, the caste system remained even though the religion was based is based on equality. So the exploitation of the lower caste is the same, they have untouchability, it's different than uh, rest of India they have endogamy they don't dine together they don't have what they call as roti beti ka rishta which is that they'll not give daughters in marriage they will not dine with them so there is this extreme segregation and in my ethnographic uh, study of the Thakarpur village there are there were like three gurdwaras there and it's such a small space and you know on the face of it they'll say oh that's fine you know uh, we just go to all or then I asked them you know it's the same religion why do you have three different and then they told me there's one for the Ravi Dasyas one for the Jat Sikhs and of course the Jat Sikhs one is the most you know beautiful one because they have they are the ones who have the money and then the one uh, which the Dalit Sikhs go to is of course the most rundown Gurdwara in the village and that's not just Thakarpura village I mean that's something you find all over Punjab uh, and your second point about uh, why uh, people uh, of the lower caste, you know, the Mazhabi Sikhs are uh, converting to Christianity uh, primarily because first of all, they are welcome in the space. Something very simple what I saw just driving past rural Punjab and stopping at any uh, church I could find. You know, there was this space where it was really hot out since last summer. And I go to this Gurdwara and I could see, you know, there are a lot of uh, Dalits there just because they look very poor. And they're sitting in this air-conditioned 
space for hours listening to the sermon in Punjabi, in chaste Punjabi. So they relate to it. And you saw in Ankur Narula's, uh, you know, it's like there are Punjabi tapas, there's music, there's dance. So there's a whole package to it. And they felt sort of left out from the mainstream uh, Sikh society. You know, they, they could not go to those spaces. And then they are provided meals after that. So it's like where they go, you know, with family on a Sunday afternoon and spend their time. The other thing is schools. And in my research, I found out the first missionary who uh, came to Punjab in 1834, even though there were schools that time in uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time, they built their own schools and reading of the Bible was compulsory in the beginning. But now with Father John Graywall, right uh, where the uh, you know where the pieta was decapitated right behind is a beautiful school and those two structures seem kind of utopian in one way because everything is so dusty and they don't have roads of course the judge Sikhs have nice big homes because their kids are in the u.s most of them are in canada so there's such a stark contrast and then you have this space for them sparkling white church and the priest who looks uh, the uh, yeah, Father John, he's a judge Sikh, interestingly. He looks like you, speaks like you, and he's just there for you. And he welcomes you in that very pristine looking, clean space. You don't sit separately for a line of langar, you know, in Gurdwaras, which they have to do in villages. You uh, are treated with respect. And one of the main things is the kids get free education. I met a Mazhabi Sikh woman, and you know, she was uh, specially abled. So she was climbing down the stairs of the church and her face was beaming and I, I was just like really curious, you know, she was smiling and I could see that she's not from a well-off family. And she told me that she converted um, two years back, her husband died and uh, she has two kids, no source of income. And the reason for happiness was because both of her kids are in convent, you know, school, studying English, so their future is set all for free. And uh, actually we gave her a ride back because the father said, why don't you drop her on the way back? And I talked to her and I realized, you know, she, she looks so happy. I mean, that was something really striking because they, they get the respect. But I guess in that process, they have to forego their Dalit identity and the history and also they are in another system of hierarchy because uh, they are governed directly from Vatican and you know Father John has that connect you know there are other bishops in between he said we are, have a hierarchical structure so for somebody who is so deprived you know anyone who gives you uh, education your kids education they give you food they give you such a nice space to be in even if you have to go back to your one room shack you know it's just like uh, for them uh, that's very very attractive and how are we doing on time should we take maybe one more question from the back all right okay so maybe we can take both of your questions since you have not asked yeah. Foreign funding, it's totally volunteer based. And 
they're doing all kinds of very creative things, including um, when you mentioned like the basement. So the RF Mart activists, when they put out their posters, right, with like um, uh, art, artwork, uh, the big thing with it. showed by uh, you yesterday in your presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sh yeah. Like, like Shesa Mil Malik, right? Yeah. She's one of the main artists. So in, even in Islamabad, which is considered, it's a capital, it's like a very like modern city, when they put it up in markets, people will take it off and they like deface it, these uh, pictures of women. So, so it's just like a general question, like overall, yeah. has it been a good thing or has it been like kind of a... Okay, let's take the other question also, which can be answered. Yeah. Uh, uh, you talked, uh, you did a contrast in your presentation between the very, very large uh, statues of Dr. Baker as opposed to the real ones that in your field work. And then uh, for the previous question, we found this a little bit more about how uh, the more the regional ones have this softer touch of love and are much more important to the community. I was hoping you could just expound a little bit more on uh, what you've seen in your field work with these and uh, just, uh, I'd like a little bit more context in that direction. If you're able to. So if you could give quick answers, then we can have some Time for yeah, I, mean, I did not mention Akwad, All, All Pakistan Women's Association, which was started by Rana Liaquat Ali, which is essentially an elite women's club of sorts, um, which is also sort of a parallel to the All India Women's uh, Conference, so which was uh, you know also run by the elite women of India. I did not bring that into the conversation right now, but I touch upon it a little um, in my chapter. But yeah, in, in the following decades also, you know, when you see the uh, Pakistan Women Lawyers Association started by Asma Jangir, also middle upper class women, right? So all of these so uh, women's movements are sort of, even though that was important in the late 70s, early 80s against the al sort of Islamization policies, they kind of had a major impact in terms of contesting it legally. Um, but Aurat March is very heartening to see, right? Because it's just, it seems more grassroots, it is led. Um, and you, you see more, you know, over the years more and more sort of rural participation in, in the marches. So it gives one a little more hope than what we've seen in the feminist movements, like you mentioned before, which was, yeah. yeah. Currently, uh, as the dynamics of the fieldwork remain very much tethered to issues of how I come across these news. Uh, like I rarely come to know of them because they don't feature in the national media. I have to keep a tab on local um, political setups and how they circulate within these small WhatsApp groups. Uh, and that's been difficult because then I have to rely on the army or like the police or the state and they rarely, rarely make it. And because I have come here in September, even those channels have been broken down because of time, uh, the, that time difference. One thing is that, so the fieldwork is like a very jarring, current, in a very jarring position currently, and how it's shaping my uh, project. The other thing is that, because this is a space that's like between the high and the low, there's something on the high and the low at all, it's actually difficult to like make art history as how it operates in America to actually make it enter into that realm and be like, you no, know, whatever you want to call as ugly or defamatory is actually like a labor of love at the end of the day. So these are like, um, and then issues of access, like changing six transports and accessing areas where you're not really welcomed and entering them with a lot of power and privilege uh, that you carry despite sharing the caste identity but not necessarily the class identity. All of those uh, things like really mar your project in many ways uh, and just like trying to find a language that is both uh, catering to an Indian and a global audience. So I think that concludes the session. Let's thank our wonderful presenters. I think, I mean, there are still many more questions. I'm guessing that you will have the opportunity to talk to our audience here more. Yeah, but let's get Happy some refills sir, before sir, we sir, start sir, the next sir, session. Sir, sir, sir. Thank you.
Right? And then yeah. we were supposed to go to these villages. 